Welcome to Lincoln Log, where we speak with leading historians and other officials about their stories, research, and wisdom. Expand your knowledge and indulge your curiosity here on Lincoln Log. This podcast is produced by the Abraham Lincoln Association, aiding and promoting Abraham Lincoln's life and legacy. Founded in 1908, the ALA remains the nation's oldest and largest Lincoln organization. Learn more at abrahamlincolnassociation.org. Greetings. I am your host, Joshua Claiborne, and I am pleased to welcome Professor David Blight to our Lincoln Log podcast. He serves as the Sterling Professor of History, African American Studies, and American Studies at Yale University, and also serves as Director of Yale's Gilder Lerman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition. Professor Blight won the Bancroft Prize and Frederick Douglass Prize for Race and Reunion, the Civil War in American Memory, published in 2001, and the Pulitzer Prize and Lincoln Prize for Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom, published in 2018. The New York Times called it one of the 10 best books of the year. Simply put, our guest is one of the most celebrated active historians around. Thank you, David, for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Josh. It's uh, great to be here with you. Um, I certainly want to delve into Frederick Douglass and your incredible biography of him, but I want to begin with this question. What first prompted your own interest in history generally, and what do you see as the spark that lit your fire for history? Well, my goodness, that goes back to uh, at least my teenage years, if not even earlier. Uh, I did not get the spark for history from family. Uh, my father was, just, was a working class uh, auto worker in Flint, Michigan. Uh, I, uh, but I convinced my parents uh, to take me to historic sites when I was as young as 10 and 12 years old. And I'm not even sure where that initial spark came from, but I will admit that by the time I was an early to, to late teenager, I was reading Bruce Catton. And uh, I've in, in recent years come out of the closet as a great admirer of uh, Bruce Catton. Uh, I loved his narrative style. And as a kid, I started reading Stillness at Appomattox and Mr. Lincoln's Army, and many others of, of Catton's books about the Civil War. Uh, so that had a certain bit to do with, but I had two high school history teachers who were also pivotal. That's a, that's a cliche sometimes for people, but I truly did have two remarkable, quite old fashioned, but remarkable history teachers in high school. One taught Western Civ, as it was called then, and I loved it. Uh, this was a crotchety old man named Jack Howe, who rarely smiled, but my goodness, he instilled a sense of history. I, I fell in love with Mesopotamia and the Romans and the Greeks and you know I, I, I loved that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I had an American history teacher, a woman <laughs> named Mildred Hodges, who was very old-fashioned. Uh, she taught almost nothing about events. I guess she was an early proponent of, of the social history revolution without maybe even knowing it. She really taught about events. She always taught causes and consequences. We were always making these diagrams of causes and consequences, causes and consequences. <clears throat> and I think that had some impact. She also used to tell us, this was in Flint, Michigan, during Flint's very uh, prosperous times and it had a good school system. But she was, Mildred always was telling us that she had gone to Columbia University and studied with Richard Hofstadt. And she used the Hofstadter uh, reading uh, documents reader. Uh, I, so I was reading a, doc, a Hofstadter documents reader in high school. I think she reminded us at least once a week that she was a Hofstadter student. I, I don't think she needed to do that. But. So those were initial inspirations. And then I had an older brother who was quite an influence, um, both in a lot of ways. Uh, he's three years older. Um, he became quite an intellectual in his own right once he gave up professional baseball. And uh, he was always an, in, an influence on me to keep reading history and read mm -hmm. this, read that. He went into the history of science initially. Um, so by the time I went to college, I was a congenital history major. I, that's all I really wanted to do. Um, but it didn't come from any one person. Um, it didn't come from any single experience. 
it was just a process, but there's no question that teachers had something to do with it. Well, it, and you mentioned your high school teachers, and I love that your own start in teaching, as I understand it, uh, began as a public high school teacher for about seven years. Um, why did you transition to the collegiate level, and, and did your background as a high school teacher, how does that influence your work now as a historian? I don't know for sure, but I still believe the most important teaching I've ever done was seven years in a very large public high school in Flint. Uh, which then was a, uh, a melting pot of the American uh, working class and middle class. I think the school was around 40 to 50 percent African-American when I started. By the time I left, it probably was 60, 65 percent. And this was the 1970s. So there was <laughs> this was the aftermath of the civil rights movement. Uh, we were teaching a course called Black America which we were inventing as we went. There were three or four of us doing it. And we didn't necessarily know what we were doing, uh, but I had taken the first ever African-American or black history course taught at Michigan State, where I was an undergraduate. It was taught by a man named Les Rout. Uh, Les was actually a Brazilianist by training. Mm. He wrote books on, on Juan Peron and the coffee uh, boycotts and empire. Uh, but he was African-American, so they apparently told him, Les, you teach this. But it was really fundamental. I mean, I'd never really learned much of anything about slavery or black history or, or at all uh, until that experience, which would have been about 1968 or 69. And uh, so here we were trying to create black history courses at a, at a very volatile time in American race relations. The whole busing issue had exploded, mm -hmm. including in Flint. Um, so uh, those were pivotal years. Uh, I used to, in fact, for five years, I engineered and led field trips for these kids mm -hmm. from Flint, Michigan, as we used to say, out east to Civil War sites. I took them to Gettysburg, Harper's Ferry, Antietam. Uh, in 1976, I took a busload of 50 kids on a bicentennial field trip to Philadelphia, Washington. Uh, and that was a kind of teaching, you know, that uh, I think conditioned me in some ways to be interested in public history, you know, to be able to go to historic sites and make them mm -hmm. meaningful to young people. Um, but after six or seven years, I had done a master's degree in history at Michigan State. Um, I did it part-time, took like three and a half years to do it because I would do one course at a time. But that experience of doing the MA and doing real research, uh, doing seminar papers, got me to the conclusion finally that I wanted to try this. I wanted to go off to graduate school, try to do a PhD, mm -hmm. uh, see if I could be a college teacher. And again, my brother, Jim, was important in that because he had already gone off to do a PhD had just finished and uh i had that one model uh that right. i could look to well so i i, I guess you're probably your study in race relations and black america probably helped feed an interest in frederick Douglass. could you talk about that and then also what sparked your seminal biography because as i understand it it involved a seemingly random meeting with a douglas collector in georgia <laughs> where you really came did. across some papers yeah um fortuitous to say the least. Well, I didn't learn anything about Douglas in high school. Most of us didn't in the 60s. Uh, Douglas's narrative, as many now know, was out of print for nearly a century. Um, it was while I was a high school teacher that I first became really aware of Douglas. I remember having posters of him in my classroom and teaching excerpts of a few speeches and so on. But when I went off to graduate school, I wanted to work on as a dissertation topic. I wanted to work on abolitionism. I wanted to work particularly on black abolitionism if I could and the relationships of whites and black abolitionists. And through a process, I landed on Douglas. I did a dissertation on Douglas, which was my first book it's called Frederick Douglass's Civil War. Uh, a somewhat narrow slice of Douglass's life and thought, the meaning of the Civil War in his life. But with time, I then did editions of his first two autobiographies. I put the Columbian Orator back in print in the late uh, 90s. Um, 
that's the book Douglas discovered as a, as a child in Baltimore that really changed his life. I wrote essays on Douglas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And Douglas had been part of almost every other book I've ever written. In fact, Race and Reunion has a great deal of Douglas in it. But I had Douglas out of my life, he was gone. Uh, until, as you just said, about 12 going on 13 years ago now, I uh, went to Savannah, Georgia to give a talk to high school and middle school teachers about Douglas's narrative, which I've done many times. And I enjoy doing that a lot. And while I'm there, the leaders of the Georgia Historical Society invited me to meet a local collector. I had lunch with him. He took me over to his house. His name is Walter Evans. He's now a dear friend and a kind of patron. And that day, Walter showed me on his dining room table portions of his Frederick Douglass manuscript collection, which was and is extraordinary. And uh, I didn't on the spot commit to a new biography. In fact, that was just too daunting to me at that point. Mm -hmm. It took months to really decide. But Walter is a remarkable man. He's an African-American retired surgeon who grew up in segregated Savannah, came north for his higher education. He went to Howard University, then he went to the University of Michigan Medical School. And he practiced in Detroit hmm. for over 30 years as a surgeon, a general surgeon. Did very well at it. That gave us something in common too. You know, I'm from Flint, he's from Detroit. He was, he was a Detroit Tigers a season ticket holder, by the way, and we never were. But anyway, uh, that within some months, I finally decided, well, if I don't do this and use this collection in some way, somebody else will. Hmm. So through a process of months, I committed to doing this new biography of Douglas. And I'll mention just one other thing. Anyone who's read the book knows this. Um, the Evans collection is, is amazing. It, it, the core of it is about nine very large family scrapbooks that were kept by Douglas's sons. But those scrapbooks and lots of letters and other documents cover particularly the last third of Douglas's life from the Civil War to the end of his life in 1895. That's the period of Douglas's life we have heretofore not known as much about, or for that matter, not even been as interested in, because the younger, heroic, escaped slave Douglas, the young orator, or the, you know, the young leader up to the Civil War has tended to be the Douglas that fascinates us, mm -hmm. the rebel, you know, the revolutionary. But the aging Douglas took over the book for me because of that collection. Mm -hmm. It turns out an aging old radical who becomes a kind of political insider uh, in the Republican Party and even with his appointments in the federal government is an absolutely fascinating story. And that Evans collection made telling that story possible. I might add one last thing. After many years of negotiation and trying, we now have uh, here at the Beinecke Library at Yale, uh, we have Walter not only committed, but it, the collection has already been delivered wow. here to New Haven, and it is going to be very soon announced. It's a major acquisition by the Beinecke uh, Rare Book and Manuscript Library here at Yale. So it's, 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 it's great that that collection is finally going to be in a great library where people can use it. Right. I used to, I spent a lot of weeks in Savannah. <laughs> I bet. Pouring over him. Well, that's wonderful. And, and you're right. I'm fascinated too by his latter life. And I lo love uh, that your book focuses on that so much. But, but for our listeners who may not know as much about Frederick Douglass, he was born into slavery. Uh, his father was probably one of his masters. Uh, what stood out uh, really as notable about his childhood to you? Well, he... Uh, <laughs> He, for, on the one hand, he saw just about every kind of savagery that, you know, barbarism that slavery could enact uh, or could wreck on people, older people, young people. He experienced it as well from owners and people he was rented out to. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, he also had certain lucky breaks. So the greatest lucky break, perhaps, was that he was sent to Baltimore. He spends 20 years as a slave, 
uh, about 11 of them out on the eastern shore of Maryland, uh, eventually working as a teenage field hand uh, and under some pretty brutal circumstances with an overseer named Edward Covey, uh, with his owner Thomas Auld. But he spent nine of those 20 years in Baltimore, an urban setting, obviously. Uh, and Baltimore was the means by which Douglas began to see a world, learn, gain literacy, and be part of a larger black community. Uh, Baltimore, at the time Douglas escaped in 1838, had about 3,000 slaves, most of whom worked down in the maritime industries to that great port city of Baltimore, but it had about 17,000 free blacks. It had a pretty vibrant free black community with churches and debating societies, et cetera, et cetera. And he got very involved in that community as well. It was a fluid relationship between slaves and free blacks in a southern city like Baltimore. And it's from there that he will escape in 1820, uh, fully literate, although still with a great deal to learn about how to use language, uh, spelling, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but Baltimore, and he would often refer later to his Baltimore dreams, as he put it, which meant the ways at, when he was working at the docks or when he was involved with local black preachers or involved in, in a debating society or after he met Anna, who would be his first wife, how much that city made him dream his way out. And I love that you uh, titled one of your chapters Baltimore Dreams, too, as I recall correctly, based on that. I did because it's a, it's just a huge turn in his life, uh, slow at first and then pivotal when he escaped in 1838. I'm fascinated that Douglas said in different ways that he was less concerned about the dangers of slavery to his body and mm. more concerned about slavery's effect on his mind because of the humiliation. And, and do you feel like, did Baltimore give him sort of a glimpse of an escape from that humiliation um, or... What drove that perspective on in terms of slavery's effect on his mind and how that changed? I'm so glad you asked that because it is true. He, he would commonly comment on that, that, that slavery's assault on the body was one thing, but it was the risk of losing mental control or um, mental dignity uh, that was worse to him. Um, I think Baltimore was crucial in that because, again, he sees this maritime world of the Baltimore Harbor. He sees the clipper ships. He had a lot of terrible experiences down in the docks. He got beat up by <laughs> other caulkers and other, other workers uh, who didn't want him taking their jobs. Uh, but he saw a vibrant community. He began to read newspapers. He began to read all kinds of things, whatever he could get his hands on. He began to imagine his way out into some larger world. I also think that his stress on the mental um, difficulties of slavery over the physical does have something to do over time with how much he became a writer. Mm. I mean, this, this is an extraordinary prolific writer eventually, three autobiographies, 1,200 pages of autobiography, thousands of speeches, uh, hundreds and hundreds of the short form political editorials, one novella, and the more and more and more, the more he became uh, such a self-conscious thinker and writer, you know, this was all about the mind, uh, keeping mind free, liberating, you know, himself mentally. Uh, if, if we didn't have those millions of words that he wrote, we might not know I mean, how much he reflected <laughs> on the mental versus the physical assaults of slavery. That doesn't mean he downplayed uh, the physical dimensions of slavery. In fact, his autobiographies are full of those descriptions of savage beatings, of, particularly of other slaves that he witnessed even as a child. Hmm. So he eventually uh, begins preaching in Massachusetts and joins the abolitionist circuit um, and then writes his first autobiography, which is, remains perhaps the best slave narrative. Uh, how did he learn? I mean, you mentioned this, that he somehow learned to write, but how did he learn to write so well and seemingly so quickly? Yeah, it is, it is astonishing. And it's partly a mystery, but there are ways to discern how this happened. 
Uh, he was first taught his alphabet and letters for about a year, year and a half by his mistress in Baltimore, Sophia Auld. He's only about eight years old, and eight, nine years old. Then in the streets of Baltimore, he meets all these white kids. They're all immigrant kids. They're Irish and German immigrant kids. And they all are carrying this school reader called the Columbian Orator, which was the second best-selling school reader in the United States next to the McGuffey reader. He gets his own copy of that. When he's about 11, he bartered for it, the local bookstore on Thames Street in Fells Point. Hmm. Uh, he loved that book. Uh, it became his most precious possession. He will carry that copy in a pocket when he escaped from slavery out of Baltimore to New York in 1838. The opening introductory essay of that book is, um, is a manual about oratory. Hmm. It was written by this man named Caleb Bingham back in the 1790s. And it's, it's a how-to uh, piece on oratory, how to, how to modulate your voice, how to use your arms and your neck and your head, uh, how to build two crescendos of your voice. It also has all this Aristotelian stuff in it, although Douglas didn't need to know Aristotle to learn this, but it had to do with how a, a true orator must reach the moral core of his audience, must reach a moral message with his audience, must be both emotion and analysis and so on. He's reading this when he's an early teenager. And he found that he was good at this, that he could get on his feet and preach. He could get on his feet and talk. And uh, like any, I mean, the way I analyze it is not only did he have these lucky breaks of people teaching him, and he ends up sitting for days and days and days with an old black preacher in Baltimore uh, named uh, Charles Lawson, who, who read the Bible out loud with him for, for days, whenever they had time, especially on Sundays, especially the Old Testament. Uh, that language of the King James Bible got into his head, the cadences of it, and so on. He found, like, like any kid, then or now, all kids want to know or want to figure out what they're good at, right? And we all wanted to be good at something. If that's, you know, early on, I wanted to have the best slider and curveball I could <laughs> develop, you know, and so on. It turned out it, turned out it wasn't very good. All I ever managed was a sinking fastball. But Douglas found out that he was good at words. He was good at kind of speaking in various ways. And he was raw. He was raw as he could be when he escaped from slavery. But he had practiced writing already. You know, he had a little notebook he practiced in. But no one should think he was some sort of uh, already perfectly born writer when he escapes from slavery at age 20. That's not true at all. He was a bad speller. It took him a while to model other writers, model other abolitionist writers, um, in order to then finally put down on paper the story of his life. His first major piece of writing of any kind is that narrative, which he wrote when he was 27 years old, seven years out of slavery. But that narrative, for anyone who reads it, the first thing you need to know about it is that it really is Douglas summing up and telling the stories that he had already been telling for three and a half years out on the lecture circuit, uh, sponsored by William Lloyd Garrison's Abolition Society in Massachusetts. Story after story after story about his youth. He sat down in the winter of 1844 and 45 and sort of put it together mm -hmm. in a story form. That's where we see him as, <laughs> for the <laughs> for the first time as a truly self-conscious artist, a writer who is a brilliant storyteller. And I guess we ought to mention here too, as he starts to really hone his speaking and his writing skills, he does take what seems like perhaps one of his most significant events is traveling to the British Isles. What does that really signify for him and, and how does that change him? Huge turning point in his life. Other than his escape from slavery and his emergence as a public speaker out of New Bedford and then out of Mass other parts of Massachusetts, it was the first or second great turning point of his life. In 1845 to uh, the spring of 1847, he toured for almost 19 months uh, the British Isles, Ireland, Scotland, England. 
He was sponsored to a great extent by the Garrisonian Abolitionist Society, the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society back home. But he took Ireland, Scotland, and parts of England by storm, particularly as an orator. But when he went over there, he had boxes full of, of his narrative, which had just been published the summer of 45 before he um, embarked for England in August. Uh, and it's really in England where he, he honed his chops as an orator. He honed his chops on issues like religious hypocrisy. He honed his chops on the natural rights tradition and he was embraced. He was embraced by the Irish, the Scottish, and British abolition um, uh, circles. More than embraced, he was welcomed. He was treated like a sort of exotic conquering hero. He made many lifetime friendships while he was there. And indeed, it was a group of British abolitionists who raised the money to purchase his freedom such that by the time he returned in the spring of 47, he had his free papers from Thomas Auld, Thomas and Hugh Auld, the two brothers owned him at that point. And he refused to come back to the United States uh, without those free papers until they arrived. Uh, so it's an absolutely pivotal experience. And, and in part because he faced, although he faced some racism around the British Isles and he, he saw minstrel groups that he hated, but nothing like what he had experienced in America. Mm -hmm. uh, he was embraced. In fact, in Scotland, they embraced him so much, they wrote poems about him, songs about him. He'd go into a small Scottish town to speak at the local church, and there'd be a, a group of children singing a song about him. I mean, imagine that. You're only 27, 28 years old, and here's... And, and, and by the way, he, of course, had taken his name, Douglas, from an epic poem by Sir Walter Scott. And if anyone ever visits Edinburgh, uh, you, you can't miss it. It's right in the heart of the city. There's this gigantic Sir Walter Scott statue. That had just been un unveiled about two or three years before Douglas arrived there. So imagine, you've taken your name from a Scott poem. Right. And here are these people writing poems about you in Scotland. I mean, what a, what a flowering, what a realization. But he's he almost like America. He, he was back into the kind of hothouse of American racism mm. and it made him a very angry young man. And he's almost, would you say, pro perhaps the most uh, popular and well known American internationally at the time? Um, uh, he certainly of? became so by that point in time, by mm. 47. Um, there were some others, there were some other African American abolitionists who also toured England, especially by the 1850s. And then there was William Lloyd Garrison himself, but, and there were some artists uh, who were also quite popular. But yes, he becomes eventually the most famous international American abolitionist figure, both in symbolic terms and real terms, because that narrative, by the way, was widely read all around the British Isles. He couldn't even keep it in print. He published a new edition in Dublin. Actually, there were two new editions. There are two Irish editions that were published while he was over there just to keep the thing available. Going, and, yeah, available, wow. He would go out and do a speech. He'd have a box of books to sell. Well, you mentioned William Lord Garrison, and um, certainly they were close allies, and Garrison uh, sort of a, would you say, a mentor of sorts. Oh, yeah. Uh, but, but, but they eventually uh, broke up. Um, and that leads to a mental breakdown of sorts for Douglas. And really, I think out of that comes some of Douglas's greatest writing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, mm -hmm. Could you describe their relationship both as it sort of was positive when it was building and then what caused that breakdown and, and the effect it had on, on Douglas? Uh, yes, Garrison was a tremendous influence on Douglas's life. Uh, they first meet in 1841. Uh, when the Garrisonians invited Douglas. He, Douglas had been discovered by other Garrisonian abolitionists preaching in a small black church in New Bedford where he lived, uh, either in late 1840 or early 1841. He meets Garrison, he goes out to Nantucket uh, to a big Massachusetts anti-slavery convention. He tells his story, he takes the place by storm, 23 years old. And Garrison hired him to be an itinerant lecturer on the circuit, to, to travel around with groups of other abolitionists. And in those years, 
this very young man, 23, 24, 25 years old, still a fugitive slave, still, still susceptible to being captured and returned to slavery. Garrison was kind of a savior figure to him. He was indeed a mentor, more an older brother, possibly even father-like. They were 12 years apart in age. Uh, and Douglas learned a lot from Garrison. He learned a lot about how to use language, how to use the Bible in his rhetoric. And he learned a great deal about um, the uh, you know, expository writing by reading Garrison's famous newspaper, The Liberal, how to use persuasion, how to use propaganda, how to attack to get the attention of your audience. There's no question to me. If you read enough of The Liberator and you start reading then Douglas, you can see the influence. Mm -hmm. But this was a, you know, a testy, eventually, uh, uh, relationship, as most are, of uh, very ambitious, very talented people, both of them. One older, one younger, one white, one black. Now, Garrison was the real thing. Uh, People should be very careful about charging William Lloyd Garrison with, with racism and his needs to control Douglas, because Garrison was deeply devoted to racial equality as well as to ending slavery. But after the, the tour of Britain, where he shared the platform, by the way, for several months with Garrison, who came over and toured around with him, and Douglas was sort of the second act. But by the time Douglas returns to America and he turns 29 years old, uh, he wants to move, he wants to found his own newspaper, he wants independence, and most importantly, he wanted to get out from under the ideological influences of Garrison. Garrison believed in, as many would know, uh, the principles of moral suasion. He did not believe in the use of political parties. He believed the political parties uh, were inherently evil. Uh, he believed the US Constitution had no value to abolitionists, that it was thoroughly a pro-slavery document, and as he called it, a covenant with death. Mm -hmm. um, now, Garrison preached these principles. They were like tenets of uh, a faith. And if you joined down with Garrison, you had to uh, toe the line. You were not to be involved in political parties. You, the Constitution was evil and pro-slavery. Um, and Garrison even advanced this idea of disunionism, meaning a kind of almost anarchistic belief that Americans should not participate in the American political system on any level. And it doesn't mean that Garrison was apolitical. Ironically, he would preach all this moral suasion and then follow the politics of Washington, D.C. Uh, assiduously in his newspaper. <laughs> so, but, but here's Douglas, 29, turning 30 uh, by 1848, moves out to Rochester, creates his own newspaper, and Garrison hated that. And did, as did the other Garrison. They did not want him creating a competitive newspaper. This kid was so, he's not a kid anymore. This guy was so talented. They did not want him creating some sort of offshoot movement, his own newspaper. And they began to break up badly mm -hmm. around 49, 1850, and especially into 1851, ideologically. Then there was, of course, a, a, a terrible personal breakup as well. Um, it had to do with, well, it had to do with many things. The rivalry of generations is one thing. Um, but it had to do with a woman named Julia Griffiths, an English woman whom Douglas had met in England. And to make a very important long story short, she had uh, followed Douglas. This was a very talented, uh, very well educated English woman, Julia Griffiths, who came to America first with her sister. Uh, and joined Douglas's uh, efforts in Rochester by 1849 as his assistant editor. She was his fundraiser, his, her, his assistant editor. She helped critique his writing. In fact, there's no question in my mind, she helped make him a better writer mm. at a time when he needed it. And uh, she was his fundraiser. <laughs> that kept that newspaper alive. She even with her sister's resources purchased the mortgage on Douglas's house and allowed the family to keep the house. And then some. Now, 
uh, eventually by 51 and 52, Garrison and his organization in Boston accused Douglas of having an affair openly in his own house with this English woman in front of his wife and family, which Douglas vehemently denied. So did Julia Griffiths, so did Anna Douglas, his wife. Now, we will never know for sure. Uh, what we do know is that relationship was extremely important. It was the most important at that moment friendship Douglas had in the world. He needed Julia Griffiths badly to, to raise money, to help him edit that newspaper, to keep that operation going. We need to remember here, Frederick Douglass never made a dime between entering the abolition movement in 1841 all the way to 1877 when he, he will get his first federal appointment from Rutherford B. Hayes. He never made it done any way but with his voice and his pen and that newspaper. Hmm. And he really didn't make a living off that newspaper. But without it, uh, he might have lost everything. I personally don't think that was a sexual relationship he had with Julia Griffiths, but it was a deeply important friendship. We, we hmm. know that for sure. Um, the Garrisonians tried to blow this up. They did blew it, blew, blow it up publicly, accused him of this affair very publicly. And that's when they broke. Their relationship not only soured, it broke apart completely. And they never were in the same physical space again for at least 10 years until after the Civil War broke out. And they never really made up, hmm. which is a, a sad story in many ways. Um, of what happened to Douglas and Garrison. But it's a big turning point in his life. It's a big loss to him. Because mm -hmm. it wasn't just Garrison he was losing, but this whole Garrisonian community of radical abolitionists now abandoned Douglas. He was on his own. Mm. Uh, yet out of the emotional pressure, he somehow seems, maybe because of that, it inspires some of his greatest work at the same time, right? I mean, that's uh, around that time, some of his best writing, you see. It's an amazing point, yeah, and I do make a pretty big deal of that in the book, because here he is writing these editorials, amazing editorials, as he's becoming a much more political abolitionist. He's even beginning to suggest possible uses of violence in the anti-slavery movement. He participates in the rescue of fugitive slaves. Uh, he embraces certain political movements. He writes his one novella in 1852, The Heroic Slave. He writes some of his greatest speeches, indeed his greatest speech in 1852, the 4th of July speech that he gave in Rochester, which is still now read all over the world. Um, and then he wrote what I think is his long form masterpiece, Bondage and My Bondage and My Freedom, his second autobiography, which he wrote between 1854 and 55, publishes it in the summer of 55. Julia Griffiths left Rochester to move back to England forever uh, right after that book was published. Mm. I do think she had a hand in, uh, you know, helping edit that, that master right. 440 page autobiography, which is much more political. Um, and it's a fascinating autobiographical journey into the great political question of slavery in the middle of the 1850s. So yes, he does much of his greatest work in this very period when his life is kind of being torn inside out. He's not the last or the first great writer to do sure. absolute greatest work under emotional distress. Pressure, right. So this kind of leads us to the Civil War, and um, I'm always intrigued at how Douglas frames the philosophical and moral debate of the Civil War. Could you just briefly touch on how he viewed that battle, that war? Well, sure. Uh, in many ways, uh, the breakup of the Union and some kind of sanctioned war upon slavery and slaveholders is what Douglas had always dreamed of. It doesn't mean he had it all figured out. He didn't know exactly how it was all going to happen. But this really is what he had come to believe had to happen, tragically, uh, by the late 1850s. It's why he became close to, but did not join John Brown in the raid on Harper's Ferry, mm. the thing he didn't. But Douglas did see the Civil War as a kind of final culmination of this moral and political struggle over two kinds of futures. One, a future of free labor 
and at least the beginnings of racial equality and the United States somehow going through an Armageddon that would transform it into some means of, of living up to its principles. The other future would have been uh, what many called, and he did, a slaveholder's republic, a place where slavery would somehow be permanent and certainly racial uh, suppression would be permanent in, in an American future. Um, Douglas, make no mistake, embraced the war. I have a whole chapter in the book, of course, and what a thumping war propagandist he became, a uh, vicious war propagandist, which I think is rooted in his memories of his own experience of slavery. He saw the American Civil War also in biblical terms. Mm -hmm. He did have, um, to a great extent, a kind of Christian biblical worldview about history. The history was somehow something happening with occasional divine interventions. That's never easy to show, to pr and never easy to prove, never easy to even understand. But Douglas was one of those among many 19th century Americans who did see this thing called the American experiment as somehow uh, under some kind of divine design. But that design he had come to believe, especially from so much influence of the Hebrew prophets, the Old Testament prophets, whom he used and quoted all the time. Joshua and Isaiah, I'm sorry, Jeremiah and Isaiah especially. He had come to believe that America had to be destroyed in effect in order to be recreated. Hmm. Now that's that's not a that's not a you know a recipe for a pleasant view of history right. by any means. Um, he welcomed the blood of the Civil War, and uh, it took time. And uh, as you know, uh, he did not support uh, the Lincoln administration or the policies of Lincoln, at least during the first full year of the war. It took time for him to shoulder up to what seemed to him a far too limited approach to making war on the South. Well, that's a great segue. And obviously this is a Lincoln log. And so that uh, obviously is a thread through all of our podcasts. But as you mentioned at the onset of the war, uh, they, they weren't close. In fact, I believe Douglas described Lincoln as, the, quote, the most powerful slave catcher in the North. Yeah. And yet um, the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation is issued in September 1862 and the final proclamation in January 1863. Mm -hmm. um, how did their relationship change? Were the, were the proclamations part of that driving force or what other events helped warm the relationship between the two of them? They you got to remember, Douglas was not inside any Republican Party circles at this point in 60-61, even into 62. He had no context inside the formal Republican Party to speak of at all. Uh, he is back in Rochester, New York, reading everything in newspapers, you know, covering the war, writing every month in his newspaper about the war advocating that the war be a crusade against slavery, that the black men be enlisted and so on. He was extremely disappointed for the first year because the official policy by and large of the Lincoln administration and the Union Army was to return fugitive slaves to their loyal owners. That was not viable. And as a policy, it was all falling apart by the spring and summer of 62. But you, you pointed to the key thing the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation uh, surprised Douglas. It inspired him to a great extent. He was worried, you know, there's the 100 day period between the preliminary and the final proclamation. What could you trust? Mm -hmm. Now, Douglas had always believed that this issue of slavery, and this is the way he had interpreted the secession crisis. He somehow believed American politicians were still going to find some new compromise. They were going to compromise their way out of this because they had before many times. Missouri Compromise, 1850 Compromise, Kansas-Nebraska Compromise, and so on. But that didn't happen this time. In order to win this war, it became clear to Lincoln and many people around him, um, and at least to enough of the battlefield commanders in this war, that you had to make war on slavery and destroy that system if you were going to defeat and destroy the Confederacy. 
Now, the preliminary proclamation really did inspire and his rhetoric changes, but it was the final proclamation and its likelihood of being signed that finally put Douglas in Lincoln's camp, at least mostly in Lincoln's camp. Now, there are many events that occurred in that period, but I'll point you to one in the aftermath of the Emancipation Proclamation. Douglas was inspired by the fact that finally in this proclamation, two new things appeared. One was the recruiting, essentially the order to recruit black men into the Union Army and Navy on some basis. The second was that the final proclamation had no language about colonization the removal of black people from the United States. One of the things that Douglas loathed the most, in fact, nothing quite animated him as much as this colonization policy that the Lincoln administration had been advocating for many, many months in 1861 and 62. In fact, the Lincoln administration recruited Frederick Douglass to be their colonization czar at one point, back in October, September, October of 62. And he, um, he told Montgomery Blair in no uncertain terms where he could put that request <laughs> to be the colonization head. Uh, to Douglas, that was the most egregious violation of, of, of the hopes of black people, being told you can't be citizens in this country, you're gonna have to find a way to be removed. Right. Um, final proclamation had no provision about that. Douglas goes home to Rochester after a fabulous celebration in Boston on the Watch Night of Emancipation. He'd already prepared an editorial called A Day for Poetry and Song. He published that. Then he wrote a new speech, which is what Douglas always did in crises. He'd go to his desk, he'd write it down. And by the way, all of Douglas's major speeches, people need to know this, exist in text. He wrote these speeches out. Now he could get up and extemporaneously blow the lights out if, if that's what you wanted but he wrote it down and he wrote a new speech in january 63 entitled the proclamation and the negro army it became in effect his template for his recruiting speeches beginning that spring and into the summer for black soldiers but in that speech which he took out all across the midwest he said many things but he said particularly he said this proclamation frees all of us hmm. It frees the Confederate soldier. It frees the Union white soldier. It frees the black slave. It frees the, the potential now of black soldiers. It frees, it frees us all from a past. It frees us to have a new history, which is Douglas's sense of what, you know, I mean, there are many ways to see this in his rhetoric during the war, but it's Douglas's sense that this war now had the possibility of reinventing the United States around equality. Equality, around right. Freedom for everybody. Um, well, and it, it, in the long run, it did. Mm -hmm. and, and my day job is as a, as a lawyer, and so the Civil War's effect and interplay with the Constitution, the law has always been fascinating to me. And obviously mm -hmm. the Declaration of Independence held that all men are created equal, but obviously that wasn't true for the founders. It generally only meant white landowning men are created mm -hmm. equal, and many of these unfortunate realities came to bear in the Constitution. And Lincoln fundamentally, as you know, changed, reoriented our view of the Declaration and Constitution, how they work together. And he called the Constitution the picture of silver inside which was an apple of gold, which is taken from Proverbs 25. Right. Um, and, and it was the Declaration, not the Constitution, which really forms the moral and political basis for the Union. Um, and they had to go hand in hand um, so that... It, you know, you couldn't, uh, or as Lincoln put it, uh, that neither the picture or the apple would ever be blurred or broken. Both were charters mm -hmm. of freedom and both were part of the same great end, self-government. And so I just love how Lincoln masterfully recast the Declaration of Independence as, a, as an aspiration. Um, yeah. The Constitution may be fixed at any given time, but for Lincoln, the Declaration was the beacon and the aspiration we had to strive to achieve. And Lincoln and Douglas really seemed to share that view of the Declaration of Independence. And I'm curious as to what degree Douglas influenced Lincoln views or Lincoln influenced Douglas's views on that declaration? Well, on the latter part, it's very hard to know. I mean, we would, you know, a lot of people would like to think Douglas had this tremendous influence on Lincoln. You know, Lincoln, Douglas was there prodding him on and so on. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's true. 
Uh, they, they met three times uh, at the White House. Two were formal meetings, Oval Office. The third was after the second inaugural. They're all extraordinary encounters and meetings, and we could go into all of that, but uh, I don't think one can claim there was this direct philosophical influence so much. Although we do know Doug, uh, Lincoln probably read some of Douglas. He tells him that, he, or at mm -hmm. least he says that Herndon or one of his aides had told him a lot about Douglas and so forth. However, what's really important is that uh, philosophically, uh, to some degree morally, and certainly legally, they started in very different places. Let's just say they, in 1860 or 61, but they come together they end up in almost the same place on the same script. And to your point about the Declaration, Douglas loved the Declaration of Independence. He saw it as the template, really, of the possibility of America. What he loved were the four, were the four first principles. <laughs> Natural rights, equality, the doctrine of sovereignty, and the right of revolution. The first principles he, Douglas saw, and he said this all kinds of times, he saw them as essentially natural rights. They were like precious ore. They didn't belong to any one group. They didn't belong to any one person. They didn't even belong to America. They belonged to all humanity. Mm -hmm. and it, without that declaration and its principles, it's not clear how a black abolitionist would have kept faith. Some didn't keep faith you know, in, in this American experiment. Douglas was always at the end of the day a vehement proponent, he could never give this up, of the essential natural rights tradition. That certain liberties, certain capacities were in us from God or from nature that could not be denied. Now, politics may deny them, violence may deny them, but however one survived that process, they would still be there. And of course, the Civil War reinvigorated this as nothing else ever could have, because it leads to the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments, First Civil Rights Act, the Reconstruction Acts, a reimagining of the U.S. Constitution. As you well know, as a legal scholar, many people have called that second constitution, Lincoln's Constitution, the Reconstruction Constitution, mm -hmm. the Constitution born of emancipation. That was Douglass's Constitution. That's the, the second constitution is the one Douglass will spend the last 30 years of his life trying to save or preserve. And, and, as, and as you mentioned, um, I think the genius and the, sort of the unique value of your book is the last part of Douglas's life. And he got to witness the North win the war. He saw his dreams of shattering slavery come true, but he, because he lives 30 more years, he lives long enough to see many mm. of those dreams dashed by Supreme Court rulings, by terror and violence like the KKK and right. Jim Crow laws. How did that affect him personally? And did he, did he die sort of feeling like it was all lost, like he had, he had failed, or did he see still some incremental victories or, or movement? He did not die thinking it was all lost, but he went through various periods. This is a roller coaster ride, if you think, from the, recon the late Reconstruction years uh, into the 80s, into the 90s. Um, he was extraordinarily disappointed by certain Supreme Court cases, the Cruikshank case of 76, and especially the 1883 civil rights cases, he gives a despairing speech in the wake of the 1883 case by the Supreme Court, which in effect <laughs> ruled the 14th Amendment's equal protection moot, mm -hmm. except for enforcement within the states. Uh, he doesn't live quite long enough for Plessy v. Ferguson on the legal uh, side. Uh, he was always uh, appalled outraged, angry at the uses of violence across the South, and for that matter, other places too. Um, Douglas, though, kept, I think he kept hope alive, if you will, uh, for the preservation of this story in, first of all, the experience of the war, the experience of almost 200,000 black soldiers serving, two of whom were his sons, of the experience of seeing all that outpouring of black political action voting during Reconstruction, 
He had become a political insider inside the Republican Party by the 1870s, 1880s. He becomes U.S. ambassador or minister to Haiti in 1889. He held two major positions in the federal government uh, uh, during the 70s and early 80s. And he did become a little out of touch with the experience of the freedmen in the South. There's no question about that. But he ends his life dealing essentially with the issue of lynching. The last great speech of his life called Lessons of the Hour, sometimes it's, it goes by another title called Why the Negro is Lynched, is a brilliant analysis of why lynching was occurring in America. He has a series of three excuses, he says, for why people are lynched. It's a pretty good historical, even sociological analysis of why that was happening. It's a despairing speech to a great extent. He first writes it in 1893. He gives it dozens and dozens of times through 94. He's going to die in February of, of 95 because he had heart disease and he wasn't well at all. But that speech does end, even, even that speech ends with a kind of a, a common Douglas move. He, he ends that speech essentially on the hope that you can never destroy natural rights no matter how many people you can kill, hmm. no matter uh, how bad uh, legal discrimination would become, that that experience of emancipation is there, is laid down. It can always be used later. Of course it was. Now, it doesn't mean Douglas died having any of this all figured out. Uh, he dies in 1895. He also, one must say, managed in his life, in his extended family life, which was a very difficult, conflicted family, he managed sources of hope from that too. The last day of his life, he attended a women's rights convention hmm. in Washington, D.C., sat on the platform with Susan B. Anthony. They didn't even ask him to speak. They just wanted him to be there because by then he'd become this hugely symbolic figure. Right. And he went home and died of a heart attack at 6 p.m. while the carriage showed up outside because he was yet again supposed to go that night and speak at a black church. I think Douglas took hope, as many of us do in hard times, like right now, from the work we know we have to do. And his work never ended. Well, be before we end today, I, I would like to touch briefly on, on right now. And you have uh, a wonderful column that appears today on the day we're, we're taping this in The Atlantic concerning lessons from Dave, Frederick Douglass on the tortured relationship between protests and change. And this podcast will be available for, for years from now. So just to put it in context, we're in the midst right now of tremendous protest and civil unrest over uh, uh, police tactics, race relations. Um, for those who haven't had a chance to read your Atlantic piece, and I think just generally, what lessons can we draw from Douglass that will help address some of our modern issues and modern challenges? Well, I made Douglas again the centerpiece of this essay I wrote for the Atlantic, but also made the 1850s mm. the centerpiece because we are undergoing right now threats to the very existence of an American Republic as we thought we had come to know it. There's all sorts of discussion now of whether under Trumpism, whether the United States has become a kind of banana republic, whether our essential institutions are really functioning, mm -hmm. whether it's Congress or the courts or the presidency, uh, and so on. And the pandemic, of course, has only enhanced all this fear, mm -hmm. uh, and it has revealed so many uh, racial and economic disparities about health in particular. Um, but I asked the reader in this piece to go back and look at least briefly at the 1850s. It is the only time where the United States tore itself to pieces. Its institutions stopped working and they collapsed. It's the only time when a, a major side in a, in a presidential general election refused to accept the result and the union went to pieces. Mm -hmm. And of course, we collapsed into massive militarization and all-out civil war. I suggest in the piece that we need a kind of never-again mentality, perhaps, about the 1850s. We ought to study it closely and understand if political parties break apart, if political institutions are no longer trusted, 
if you have chaos and distrust, um, if there's no center, no middle left anymore, as I don't think there was after the Dred Scott decision, for example, mm -hmm. in 1957, you are running the risk of disaster. Now, there are some people who think maybe we need another disaster. I, I, I can't bring myself to advocate that. So what I do in this essay is say, in effect, we need to remember that when we undergo a cataclysm like the one we're having, with tremendous protest against police violence and justified protest, we have to find some way to harness the rage, harness the outrage, and I share it, into politics, mm -hmm. the real politics, into voting. Because if you don't, there's a lot of history that shows us if you can't harness rage uh, into some kind of politics, then there's really only the alternative of varying kinds of revolution. And the Civil War was a revolution. Uh, it may have been a necessary one. You know, we have all this analysis over time about how inevitable it was and so forth. But we don't want to be living in a time. I mean, who wants to live in a time when disaster is inevitable? Mm -hmm. I don't. Right. So we need to look back and understand how did politics disintegrate in that era? And what is happening? I'm not suggesting that this is a direct parallel to the 1850s. I'm not suggesting that analogies are ever direct. You know, we historians sometimes misuse them ourselves. But I am suggesting that we need to look at the time we disintegrated into disunion and civil war and understand why that happened and make sure that that's not the course we're on now. Mm. You were kind enough to contribute to the anthology book I put together last year, Our American Story, where you address the possibility of a shared American narrative. And I like that you cited Frederick Douglass's 1867 speech titled Composite Nation, calling for, mm -hmm. quote, multi-ethnic, multi-racial nation incorporated into this new vision of a composite nationality, separating church and state, giving allegiance to a single new constitution, federalizing the Bill of Rights and spreading liberty more broadly than any civilization ever attempted. In this sort of, I use the word crazy times, um, do you think a unified American story is, st is still possible? It's hard. It's so multiple now, it's so pluralistic, but it's always been pluralistic. Our narrative uh, has at times been a unifying narrative around pluralism, and that's exactly what Doug was argued in that 1869 speech. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Josh, I'm, I've, I've been so grateful that you asked me back then to write a piece because I had never really paid that close attention to that particular speech by Douglas. I think I have a paragraph on it in the biography. Now I've written, you know, this 15 page essay on it or longer. Um, it's an extraordinary uh, speech in that it, it really sounds is. like a 1990s multiculturalism manifesto or, yeah. or whatever you want, or a, a, sometimes it sounds like a diversity manifesto and so on that we, too often speak of today, perhaps, but it is Douglas saying we are multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multi-racial. We're becoming more and more so that way. In fact, the middle of that speech, he makes famously a case for Chinese immigration. And that's right when the anti-Chinese immigration movement was exploding. Right. It's, the, it's the vision we, we keep saying we want to teach our children. This place, this, this American experiment, that has managed somehow to be the most pluralistic people, most pluralistic nation, living under a certain set of ideas, a certain set of creeds the world's ever seen. But can it hold together? You know, is this republic still viable? It is viable if you can find a way through politics to preserve it and then recreate it. It's only been the renewals of this the renewals of this out of the Civil War, the renewals of this idea, maybe the progressive era, the renewals of this out of the Great Depression, the renewals of this out of the Civil Rights era that have made the endurance of this uh, American experiment possible. It needs to be renewed all the time. And we may just now be living through something requiring a new kind of rebirth, uh, maybe even a new a series of civil rights acts that declare us before the world for who we are in the 21st century.
Oh, fascinating. That's quite, quite big issues to think about. Um, I really appreciate uh, your time today, Professor Blight. Um, wonderful uh, background on yourself, uh, Frederick Douglass, and how it applies today. Uh, for many of these podcasts, we end with this question, so I'll, I'll end it with this with you as well. Um, how has Abraham Lincoln affected you most, and do you have a favorite Lincoln story? Oh, my goodness. Yes. I, well, he's affected me a lot as a child. Good Lord. When my relatives found out I was this history buff, teenage history buff, to tell the truth, they started buying me Lincoln bookends and <laughs> statues, and I still have a couple of those things. Uh, <laughs> not just Lincoln logs and all that, but <laughs> real Lincoln things. Uh, and how Lincoln has affected me over time is, of course, as this um, rhetorical genius. Hmm. You know, I'm, I'm a lover of language. You can't spend your life with Frederick Douglass and not come to love rhetoric and language and the power with which he could use it. I think that's one of Lincoln's most enduring uh, strengths as well. Evident, of course, in the great speeches, but even in other places, as you pointed out. Uh, favorite Lincoln story? Oh, there's so many of them. I love the story he told uh, to some group. It may have been that group of ministers visiting him um, who came to talk to him in 62 about slavery and he wasn't acting fast enough and so on and so forth. And he said, yeah, yeah, well, I understand. And I don't have the story verbatim here, but he said, it, you know, it's a typical Lincoln move. He remembered, it reminded him of an old story of that Methodist preacher, you know, back in Illinois, who said, you know, you know, when I'm traveling, um, and I come to a big river, you know, I, I, and it's kind of flooded. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't cross it until I, I, I can really know I can get across it. I, I just don't, I don't cross it until I know I can get across it. You know, I don't know if he got a lot of chuckles from those, those preachers, but it was, that's so Lincoln, you know? Right, right. He plays it off in some, some weird story from the prairie but it that's who he was right in his way of saying you know look i'm kind of going where you're going i think but i gotta wait for events i gotta wait for right this. I gotta wait for that and I, i'm not there yet that river's just a bit too wide for me <laughs> <laughs> i love that side of lincoln who had such a powerful sense of irony that maybe right. i've always admired most about him he had he had this sense of humility sense of irony and a sense of history right which is what presidents should have and we're missing right right well professor Blight, again thank you so much and uh we always as always enjoy talking with you same here josh thanks for having me it's been great fun take care thank you for listening to lincoln log you can subscribe to the podcast in itunes spotify or your favorite podcast app and if you like this podcast, please consider rating it on iTunes and leaving a review. This helps other people find the show.